All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pretty volatile uh, Monday, summer, uh, August Monday, so that's good. Uh, we're joined by Phil Flynn from the Price Group and also Fox Business Contributor. And uh, uh, Phil's going to be talking to us about the markets, what he's seeing out there, and uh, some general thoughts as well. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, being up here today. Uh, we just took another big dump on the market this, uh, this morning um, on oil and the stock market. Um, and, and on the concerns of the Turkish lira, that really kind of set the stage early on. Uh, the weakness in Turkey, uh, the concerns about the lira and the possible contagion, the word of the day, uh, to see basically uh, if that's going to cause bigger problems in Europe uh, and therefore the global economy. Um, we're a big believer right now that the European banks are in better shape than they were during the financial crisis, you know, with the beginning of the pigs, your, your, your grease situation and the other pigs. So we don't think it's going to be as big a deal, but it's hard to convince the traders on a summer Monday uh, when we take a look at that. One of the focuses that I want to focus on a little bit today is the oil market. And uh, we're seeing some selling here today on the market. Um, one of the things that uh, is causing the sell-off, we had a couple of things. Not only is it the Turkish situation, which has been put in downward pressure uh, on the oil market, but also a report by Genscape, uh, which seemed to suggest that uh, supplies uh, came back down. And um, let me see if the people can see, can you see the price futures group with the storage number from Genscape today? Uh, on the screen, guys. No, all we see is a uh, price of crude oil right now. All right, let me see if I go back to my share screen here real quick. Um, um, let me see how we can do this here. But uh, want to see go back to the screen share real quick. But essentially, the problem that we've had with the oil market today really has been a situation where we are seeing the sell pressure come in because of the OPEC and the Genscape number and the concerns about what is happening um, in Europe. But the Genscape number today really started the downward pressure. Um, and I was gonna show you the number, but seeing that I can't, I'll just uh, read the numbers to you. Uh, the this, this, this storage in Genscape hits 26,193,534 barrels. Uh, that is still at a historically low point, but up dramatically from where we were just Friday, August the 3rd. That shows an increase of 1,747,801 ,001 barrels. So that was a big increase for gens uh, uh, for uh, the week over week number at the Cushing delivery point. It's a sign of maybe two things to the market. Number one, some of the problems that we had earlier that reduced supply to uh, Cushing, the Sin Crude, uh, which was a Canadian oil producer that had some problems. Um, it, obviously, they're starting to produce a little more. And it could be a sign also that demand for the oil is starting to slow a bit um, as refiners start to get ready for maintenance season. So you have this combination of what's been happening here uh, for the market. And that's really kind of really put down some negative connotations in today's trade here a little bit. Phil, let um, me, let me uh, yeah. interrupt you real quick and just ask you a mm -hmm. question on that. You know, it sure. seems like in 2015, 2016, everybody was talking about how we have tons of oil, you know, oil was, you know, crude was trading at 30 bucks, below 30 at times. And, you know, uh, some other prominent people were saying, if it ever trades above 40, it'll never trade above 40 again in my lifetime, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. And now, um, you know, the, the narrative has changed dramatically, prices a lot higher, and people are saying, you know, I've read different articles on Bloomberg saying, you know, we could see oil 150, things of that nature. And then you're reading these different reports showing that there is a fair amount of oil. Like, what is your take on the oil situation in terms of supplies globally? Uh, we think that global oil supplies are probably the tightest they've been in a generation. You know, probably since the days of 2004, um, uh, 2005, you know, back during the last super cycle in oil. Um, I don't know. Can 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 you look 
what you're seeing on the screen right now. I see the the uh, crude oil, SEP crude oil chart. You're still seeing that chart. Okay, I'm trying to get to a PowerPoint for you guys here real quick. Um, it, it let me see if I can. sharing a different screen maybe. All right, let I me try one other now. thing. There we go. All right, good. I'm going to try one other thing here. There we go. This should work here. All right, can we see now? What are we seeing yes, here? Yes, I see screen? a price free. There group. you go. Hello, Price Futures Group. Isn't that pretty? Huh? <laughs> nice little oil thing. Uh, it, it's it basically that you brought this up. Those were those Genscape numbers that we were putting out today. As you can see, they came out um, and pushed the market down a little bit. But yeah, absolutely correct. In fact, seeing that you brought that up, now I can bring up this chart of um, 1998-99. And if you kind of look through the 1980s, you know, where we had this kind of sideways period um, and then oil prices kind of crashed, you see on the right side of that screen, yeah. somewhere around, uh, you know, $10 a barrel. That to me is very equivalent to what we saw um, in 2014 and 2015. You had the same type of negativity uh, that was driving down the prices and so i really think of 2015 2016 as 1999 from from a big picture viewpoint i really do and there were some comparisons that we had you know from 1999 to 2000 uh, 2001 we saw historic cutbacks in capital spending we had of course a lot of uh you know exxon joined mobile texaco went out of business and we saw OPEC and non-OPEC join forces for the first time in history. And we kept hearing, of course, that this time is different um, than it was back then. Uh, very similar to what we saw in 14 and 15. Um, same thing. So it's kind of interesting that you brought that up. Um, now, I know when you look at the market today, um, seeing the market down quite a bit, there seems to be a lot of negativity in price and it's really being driven by uncertainty, seasonal weakness, which in August is, is very prevalent. Um, and, and so it looks like we're really going to be testing the lower end of the, the recent trading range, but big picture, we're making oil trading great again. We're getting a lot of fake oil those short term, but I believe that uh, long term we're going to be looking pretty good. Um, you know, I think last year, what we were saying about the oil prices is that what was going to happen in the second half of, of 2017 was going to set the stage for the rest of the decade. And if you remember at the end of 2018, market price really soared into the end of the year. You know, we kind of struggled, you know, around $44 a barrel midsummer, uh, but we made a ran to 65 later on. This year we ran up to 73. And if you remember what happened at the end of last year, we think there's a real good possibility as we get into winter, um, we're going to see kind of the, the same type of run that we go next year. So this is kind of what we're seeing in the big picture, you know, though today we are definitely seeing a lot of weakness in the marketplace. Um, so, um, um, so basically the reasons why we think this is that the OPEC cuts that we saw recently did matter. Uh, it did re reduce global supply um, and that was a big problem. Um, the other thing is, is that we saw it in today's World's Wall Street Journal that man cannot live by a shell alone because the shell guys are still having trouble making money. Uh, which is kind of an amazing thing. And the other thing is global demand. Global demand growth uh, really has been in a situation where it succeeded expectations. We did get news today that OPEC is lowering their demand forecast a little bit, but uh, we still believe that, you know, temporary, that's going to be a temporary situation here. Um, one of the things that I wanted to get to a little bit um, if we can get to that real quick here. I had one um, question actually, uh, while yeah. you go to these different things, uh, just sure. following up on, you made a comment that the OPEC cuts, that they are working. Um, mm -hmm. So I just had a question about this, because you know over years and years and years, it's always talked about, but how do these countries, when they come up with the cuts that are gonna be done, how do they actually implement it? Because ultimately it's a lot of private companies that are uh, pulling oil from the ground and then you know exporting it. So how do they actually implement 
these specific changes when they cut oil production how do they go to a private company and say hey you know you can't uh, sell x amount or things of that nature i think you can't i mean i mean if it's a private company you know here in in the united states when we talk about shell cutting back on production um it's actually against the law for them to conspire with OPEC or any other entity to control production or put out outlets. So, so you can't. So in theory, you can't join um, OPEC. And, um, and um, so that's a separate situation. As far as the members of the cartel, um, they don't have the same rules. And the reason why we saw the OPEC production cuts work is because the two main producers that mattered in that uh, cartel was Saudi Arabia and Russia. Those two countries wanted to reduce supply dramatically, and they did it together. You know, at one point, OPEC's compliance to their production cut ran close to 122%, you know, so they over complied to make sure supplies would be back down. But something strange happened during that that uh, cut in supply. The de demand for oil grew dramatically. And now it's gonna be difficult to replace um, that oil because when you push the prices down without making investment for future production, what you really did was you created a, a, a shortage in the future. And because of that, the demand growth situation is very similar to what we saw in 98 and 99 um, that drove um, prices back up for that historic long-term run. So um, we believe right now, uh, because of that, that we think it's really a, a very opportune time uh, to be looking at um, uh, the long side of oil, and we're recommending, of course, uh, today that um, we're going to see uh, a good time to buy some options because option volatility, I believe, is about the lowest level we've seen in a year. Um, and so that's a good time to put on bullish option strategies. Uh, we're telling hedgers uh, to make sure that they get hedged because we believe that uh, we're going to see a big run up in price later in the year once we come out of the maintenance season. So that's a big thing that's happening here. Um, one of the things that we talked about today on our daily energy report that we put out every day, I think we posted it on the site today, um, is that um, uh, the, the, the problems with shale. Now, every, everybody's known, you know, I, I remember, you know, 10 years ago when we talked about shale oil production, you know, nobody knew what we were talking about. You know, when we started to say that shale oil could, you know, make the U.S. almost energy independent, we were kind of laughed off the face of the earth. Um, but at the same time, one of the concerns that we've had recently when it's come to shale is this over-reliance on shale oil um, to make up for the loss of traditional oil projects. And already we are seeing signs that here in the U.S., uh, that ability of shale oil to make up for that loss of oil um, is, is running into problems. Um, in fact, today the Wall Street Journal wrote a report that, you know, hey, you know, oil prices are back up. The shale guys should be doing great. But they were saying today that like two thirds of all U.S. oil producers failed to live within their means in the second quarter, even as oil rose above $70 a barrel. Um, and they said 50 of the major oil companies reported in the second quarter that they spent $2 billion more than they took in, um, you know, because they're burning through cash. And one of the things that we've run into in the shale patch uh, is capacity issues, um, the ability to move the oil because of the lack of pipelines. That's going to get better, but it's not going to go away. Uh, the other situation that we have with the shale oil is that it's very difficult to maintain the production levels without a lot of cash. And we're finding that there's a huge decline rate for a lot of these oil wells. And so it's taking a lot more money. And as you can see from the journal piece today, um, that that's becoming an issue. 
and the costs, general costs are going up. Um, we're hearing reports of trucking shortages. They don't have enough trucks. They don't have enough drivers. They don't have enough sand. Um, so there's some real growing pains that really raises the question of the, uh, the fact that the shale oil is going to be able to replace traditional oil projects. And, and that's why we think we're going to get into a supply squeeze similar to what we saw during the last decade. Um, so today we'd be looking at, you know, definitely some pullbacks for that today. So one, of the, one other question, it, it, you know, we always hear about how much um, price, how much uh, premium is built into the market based on, you know, uh, a terror threat or a, you know, something bad happening in the Middle East, something of that nature. What do you think is built in right now in, into the price of oil in terms of, uh, you know, something bad happening in the Middle East or in, you know? I, I would I would say that uh, you're talking probably only about two dollars a barrel at this point. Um, I think earlier on when oil was at 73, we had a higher degree of that uh, risk premium in there. Um, but I think it's come down quite a bit, which is amazing because if you look around the globe, the threats to supply are greater than they've been in a long time. You look at Iran, for example, where we're going to have these sanctions going on in November. Uh, supposedly, we're going to reduce their production by a million barrels. They're doing war games, you know, in the Strait of Hormuz, a very sensitive area for oil, but yet the market seems relatively unmoved. Um, and in a weird way, I, I think that the risk premium in oil is probably undervalued. And one of the ways you can look at that is that we would probably be seeing a higher fear rate in the price of oil than we are now. And as I mentioned earlier, actually we're not seeing that based upon the volatility. If you look at the volatility for oil, it's, it's running very, very low, almost the lowest it's been in a, in a year. And so that shows you that the market is complacent, at least right now, to the risk to supply. So if you think there is a real risk to supply in the future over the next couple of weeks, this would be the time to start buying some calls because they're really not pricing in kind of this worst case scenario yet or even a major disruption to supply. What Where seemed to change the mood on that, I think, was when uh, President Trump got OPEC to raise production. Mm -hmm. right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, well, two things. So it sounds like you're saying that you do think part of this uh, recent 10% drop over the past few weeks, uh, part of it is attributed to lack of uh, some premium coming out of what was built in in terms of risk. It is. Absolutely. And I, and I think when President Trump called on OPEC to raise production and we saw OPEC raise production, everybody took that as a sign that everything's going to be okay, we're going to have plenty of oil, and that market's going to come down a bit and we're going to have plenty of supply. Um, but I think the market is overconfident, to be honest with you, uh, about that situation. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to have that headline or we're going to have that disruption that's going to get oil prices to spike in the future. Um, you know, the same way that oil was probably a little bit too nervous about Iran early on, I think they've gone to the other end of the equation, have gone to the other direction. Um, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So I do think that over the next few weeks, as we get closer to the November deadline uh, with Iran, as far as the countries not being able to uh, buy their oil, uh, that is going to be an issue. Now, we did hear some talk that the um, that Iran turned down a chance to talk to uh, the Trump administration in September. So there's still some time to talk about this. There still could be some waivers from some of the oil companies when it comes to the Iranian supply. But right now, uh, we don't believe that um, there's going to be a, 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 a situation where, where we're not going to be we're not going to see these sanctions lifted in November. And we believe that the market is woefully unprepared uh, for the loss of this oil right now. So I think right now the market's too complacent. Um, and, um, you know, Monday afternoon you get a bearish report from OPEC. They're, they're getting more negative on demand. Um, 
you know, you got the OPEC production numbers. Saudi Arabian production actually fell, which wasn't supposed to happen. That should be a little bit supportive. But the negative mood today, I think, because of Europe and those concerns, is, you know, we're not finding those buyers just yet. But again, being, you know, this time of August, you're not usually seeing those buyers come into the market. Yeah. Well, two things I want to point out. One, you did put it on our site right away uh, when this data came out that the storage was significantly higher. And you said this is going to weigh on oil. And, you know, that was when we were close to the 67 level. And, you know, here we are 65, 80 now last. So oil mm -hmm. on the day right now we're down 2.8 percent. And, you know, like you mentioned before, we were just a, we were well above 70 uh, a few weeks ago. So we you know, we have seen a, a decent sell off here in energy. Um, you know, one question I wanted to ask you, and it's uh, pretty subjective, uh, but um, where do you get the sense that the Middle East wants energy prices? You know, President Trump came out a few weeks ago when we were above 70 and made it clear he doesn't want it above 70. Uh, mm -hmm. But where do you get the sense that the Saudis want uh, energy prices? I, I think the Saudis were leaning towards $80 um, based upon Brent, which they got. Um, and I think that they're very happy with prices, you know, in a range uh, based on rent crude between 70 and $80 a barrel. Um, and I think that when we look at every country, um, they obviously mostly want higher prices, uh, higher than they are today. Um, I do think that it was kind of interesting, the ones that were driving up oil, prices, Saudi Arabia and, and Russia seem to be happy to bring back down prices. The ones that were against the production cut in the first place, like Iran and Venezuela, now they're, they're for the higher prices. So it's really kind of crazy where the politics are. Every country, I think, in OPEC is a little bit different and their mood changes based upon what their current needs are. Uh, but I think that um, Saudi Arabia and Russia um, are hoping for another rally at the end of the year, and I think they think they're going to get one. So I think they're pretty happy with where prices are right now. I don't think they want them to fall too much further, and if they do, I think you'll hear from them and they'll probably take some action. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I wanted to jump. You started out at the very beginning. You know, we're talking right now S&P volatility is up and S&P is near mm -hmm. the low of the day. Uh, VIX is now at 1450. The high was 15 overnight. Um, you started out by saying uh, it seems like a lot of the turmoil in the VIX higher is on this Turkey news, geopolitical news. Um, you made a comment, though, that you didn't think there would be much contagion into the European banks and the European banking system. Uh, do you have any sort of... Um, news on that or is that just uh, are, are people you know right is there any follow-up to that well this isn't our first time to the rodeo when it's come to this situation um what we know right now uh, during the recent uh you know stress tests of the european banks um most of the banks in europe are in much better shape than they were uh during the pigs crisis so just from that overall viewpoint um, we think a lot of what's being driven down, of course, is fear. Now, of course, fear can, can, can become reality if things really get worse. But the European banks are working much better under Mario Draghi uh, to do whatever it takes to save the euro. Uh, and they are a lot more proactive uh, because of Draghi than they were in the beginning of the last uh, financial crisis. So even though Europe is disturbing and it's weighing on sentiment, um, ex I mean, excuse me, Turkey is weighing on sentiment today, there's still a very small part of, of the Eurozone, a very small economy. And so we believe that the rest of Europe is gonna be able to weather the storm. And we think the European Central Banks will be able to to stop any real contagion in the market. So we think this is overplayed. Um, you know, you always have to take these things seriously because, you know, everybody thought that subprime was overplayed, but it showed a much larger uh, crisis. But I don't think this is an economic crisis as much as it is as a political crisis. You know, the only reason why the Turkey banks are failing is because of Erdogan. You know, Erdogan took over the central bank. Erdogan, you know, has decided to p pick political fights with his adversaries. Um, 
And this is a guy that basically came out and said, hey, I'm running the central bank. You know, I think the cure to inflation, you know, is to lower interest rates. It's like, I don't think that's how that works, you know. Um, so obviously he um, is a little misguided. And I, and I think that that's why I believe it's more of a political crisis than a real economic crisis. Yeah, well, I guess we're going to, you know, the story's very uh, fresh, so we'll see how it uh, continues to play out. You know, we do continue to hear a lot of, look, there's so much news these days, uh, but it, it seems like there is a lot of news focused on a lot of the European banks having uh, more exposure than they'd like to Turkey. And, you know, we've had significant moves in the currency, uh, over 25, 30% in just a, a week period, and their fixed income is well moving in that direction. So I guess uh, time will tell on that one. Um, what about anything else that sticks out to you uh, in the markets? It sounds like so long term, you're uh -oh. bullish energy and, yep. um, you know, short term yeah, looking for opportunities. Yeah, I, you know, I think right now we had a last week, the grains were very explosive here on the commodity side. You know, we've had some very interesting uh, situations. Um, uh, on, the, on the grain report, but I think we're going to see some more pressure. Uh, it's the U.S. is going to produce a record amount of soybeans this year, a lot of grain, so we're, we're looking for some more downward moves on that. Um, other great opportunities that we're looking in the the long term is maybe a short coming up on natural gas. Uh, we know the natural gas prices have been high. We're probably going to have a record small injection in the storage this week. But that's kind of smoke and mirrors. What really has been driving this natural gas market has been the hot summer. One of the things that, that has shielded is the fact that is we're producing a record amount of natural gas. So we think one of the good plays going in the winter uh, is to pick up some cheap natural gas puts because we think there's a real possibility that the rally in natural gas is going to be gone um, very quickly. So that's one of the moves you might want to look into. Maybe pick up some November puts uh, for the natural gas because we think that this rally is on borrowed time in the natural gas. Oh, that's interesting. That's, uh, you know, uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on that. We've had a lot of talk on natural gas, uh, people on both sides of the market. Uh, so we'll definitely keep an eye on that. Um, perfect. Well, Phil, thanks a lot. A lot of great information, thanks, a lot of great insight. Uh, we look forward to hearing more information from you on the website. Keep us updated. You had a great call today. You gave us that information early on crude and, you know, sold thank off you. over a dollar since. So thank you for that.